All right, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Got some moving bars there, so that means we've got sound. Hello, 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 how are you doing? Some strange reason we're not getting the transmission out to Facebook. I don't know why. I have a feeling something happened with the stream key, but I will deal with that at another time. So, oh. how are you? It has been a while since our last live stream. I hope you and yours are doing well. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. There we go. There's our planetarium software. Turn on our little follower thing, my little stardusters. If you aren't already following the channel, please make sure to follow the channel on Facebook and over on Twitch.tv. Oops, just scraped my headset a little bit there. Sorry about that. If you are new to the channel, what we do here is we talk about astronomy. We use this planetarium software we have here. And we've also got a program you can get over on Steam. This planetarium software, by the way, is free. Just go download it yourself. It is Stellarium. You can get it from Stellarium.org. We'll look at it in depth in just a little bit. We'll also be using this software. This is Sandbox Universe, or is it Universe Sandbox? I always forget the actual name. Universe Sandbox, it looks like. There we go. You can get it over on Steam, and uh, we're going to be using it to take a quick peek at our solar system, which is what you see represented here, the orbits of major objects and some minor objects in our solar system. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a wee bit. And the last thing we use in our planetarium here, virtual planetarium, uh, is just a regular old web browser. Not just any web browser, we're going to be using Vivaldi today. We normally start out by talking about uh, kind of current events. Uh, this was actually from the other day. I was going to do this, uh, talk about this the other day, but uh, my microphone stand broke and ended up not being able to stream. So, whoop, I'm going to do it today. Uh, this was from NASA's Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. Just the other day. Uh, it was the 55th anniversary of Star Trek, and they found this cool nebula picture and superimposed uh, two Enterprises over it, which I thought was kind of a cool little touch, uh, because I am a huge Star Trek nerd. And you should be, too. In any case, when we are in our browser, we will bounce around between tabs and look at different things. This is the one thing I always like to start off our show with, and this is Astronomy Picture of the Day. You can find this on any web browser. Just type in Astronomy Picture of the Day. You'll get this list, and, well, this list goes back a very long time. This list goes back all the way to 1995, and so you're able to actually see many, many photos over many years. Let's turn that down a little bit. Sorry about that clipping there. Let's see, recently uploaded photos look like this. Hey, look, it's Saturn. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So when you click on a link, you get a photo usually. Sometimes there's a video or maybe an animation. It'll look something like this. Uh, there'll be an explanation right below it, so if you don't know what you're looking at, so they'll explain it for you. Uh, shows you who took the photos or made the video, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you can click on them, basically go down the rabbit hole of looking at new stuff all over the place. And here we are looking at auroras over the country of Iceland. That is something very cool. That is the Northern Lights. In the Northern Hemisphere, there's also some in the Southern Hemisphere that are called the Southern Lights. And of course, this is a material from the Sun, energy from the Sun, interacting with the North or South Pole, with the magnetic fields of our planet, uh, creating these really crazy looking colors. Usually you can click on them and they'll uh, get bigger, so that you can zoom in and download them 
making your background, things like that. Uh, that was kind of a cool photo. Looks like this is in the Southern Hemisphere. And we know that because we have the Magellanic Clouds in the image here. The Magellanic Clouds, so we're jumping ahead of ourselves here, but our galaxy, our, our sun is one single star in a galaxy called the Milky Way. And actually the Milky Way is in this image. It's off to the right, you see all of this stuff over here. There are two other galaxies in this photo. There's actually many, many galaxies in this photo, but two that you can easily see. And they are right in here. Uh, this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. This is the Small Magellanic Cloud. You do have to be in the Southern Hemisphere to see them. So anywhere below the equator of the Earth. Turn that down a little bit more. I'm not sure why it's reaching up as high as it is. Try that. Hopefully that's not too loud. Hopefully it's not too quiet either. Got to get in that sweet spot. In any case, please feel free to find this. This is free to use. It's from NASA. It's astronomy picture of the day. Uh, just click around when you find it. Look up your birthday. Look up your fam you know, favorite friend's birthday or somebody in the family. Look up their birthday and just see what picture's there. You never know what you're going to find. The archive does go back to 1995. You do have to click on full archive up here to do that because web browsers can sometimes be kind of weird uh, with some of the old formatting and the old HTML that was used. Uh, nonetheless, please take a look at this because uh, you'll get some really cool photos, things you'll want to use as backgrounds, I'm sure. Uh, that's a beautiful photo uh, with the Andromeda Galaxy. Planted right here in the middle. And as you saw there, sometimes you'll actually be able to pan over and just depends on the image. This one happens to have uh, some words pop up. Pretty helpful. All right, let's get, get to the nitty gritty, shall we? Let's turn on our planet Arium. And it looks something like this. Part one. There we go. There we go. Much better. All right. So this is the sky the way it is outside right now with no clouds, nothing along the horizons, just the sun in the sky and all the light diffracting off the atmosphere, making the sky look blue. If we deleted our atmosphere, obviously we would all die. But if there were no atmosphere, you would actually be able to see all the stars that are actually out right now. But, of course, because the sun is out, all that light gets diffracted around, so our sky turns a nice bright blue. That's the short wavelengths of the sun's light filtering through the atmosphere. During the early morning or during the evening, as soon as the sun is setting, uh, the longer wavelengths of light get through, so you get the reds and the oranges. Think of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The Blue, indigo, and violet, those are high energy, shorter wavelength light. They diffract around off the atmosphere, and so we get a nice bright blue sky during the, again, sunrise and sunset periods. Uh, you get the longer wavelengths, so you get reds and oranges and yellows. That's what gives us those beautiful skies. You're going to notice the sun is tracking from the left of our screen to our right. We are currently facing south in our planetarium. Hopefully you can see there's an S down here. That means south, west is to our right, east is to our left, the north is actually off the screen behind us, back that way. I will try to always make sure we are oriented, so at least I can tell you which direction we're looking. Now, of course, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west here on the planet Earth. That is not always the case, depending on which planet you are on. On the planet Venus, this is opposite. Planet Venus, the sun rises in the west, sets in the east. Takes an awful long time for that to happen as well. Here on the Earth, it only takes 24 hours. Hey, howdy. 
the viewer count changing. Have it up on the screen for everybody else, but it's something I can see on the back side. How are you doing? Hope you are doing well. Welcome to our planetarium show. Please share the screen, the stream, the stream. Yes, good. Off to a good start, aren't we? <laughs> uh, there we go. So now we have some more of the reds and the yellows filtering through. This is sunset tonight. We're going to talk about what's in the sky. Actually kind of uh, do some what we call visual astronomy or naked eye astronomy. Uh, stuff you don't need a telescope to find. Then we'll actually talk a little bit about uh, some of the deep sky stuff that is out tonight. But first, let's talk about the western sky. We notice the sun is just below the horizon. The sun is now setting. Along the horizon, you will see the planets Mercury and Venus. Uh, Mercury is super elusive. It is named after the messenger god in Roman mythology. There's Hermes, if you like Greek mythology instead. It's going to be really, really low, and it's honestly not in the sky for very long. Uh, later in the month, I think it's a couple nights from now, uh, Mercury will be the highest it can be in the nighttime sky. And so you'll actually see it in the sky for a total of a whole 40 minutes or so. Woo. And then it'll be gone. <laughs> in about eight weeks, it'll pop back up in the sky. So very, very elusive. Look for the planet Mercury in the sky, western sky, right after sunset. Now... The one that you will definitely see, I can guarantee you'll see this, unless you have buildings or mountains or something in the way, is the planet Venus. Now, Venus is oftentimes called the morning star or the evening star. Depends on where it is in the sky. Uh, it is currently in the evening sky, so some people call it the evening star. It is not a star. It is a planet, obviously. Stars will twinkle in the sky. Planets will not twinkle. You will notice that Venus sitting right here and Mercury right here, they really won't twinkle. But between the two of them is a star named Spica. Spica is the brightest star in a constellation known as Virgo. And there she is. Alpha Virgonis. Genus? Might be the way to say that. Uh, that's the, it's the brightest star in the constellation. But you'll notice that this star, while bright white and blue, will be twinkling in the sky. Venus will sit like a bright white orb and will not twinkle, neither will Mercury. Now there's a total of five planets that you can see in the sky uh, without a telescope. Actually, you have a little satellite flying by. Look at that. Whee! So this will be happening again tonight. You'll actually see this satellite fly by tonight around 08 p.m. or so. 8.07 it looks like. You can sometimes see the space station and other satellites flying by. But this is tonight, right around 8 o'clock, just after sunset. Now, this is set from where I happen to live. I happen to live in the beautiful state of New Mexico. Uh, so things will change depending on where you are. If you are further north, uh, these stars will shift in the sky. So they will actually shift downwards. So all the stars you see down here will actually be much lower in the sky. If you live further towards the equator, uh, these stars will actually be much higher up in the sky in the southern part. Now, as I was saying, uh, of the objects in the sky, it turns out there are five of them that you can see uh, without a telescope, just shining brightly. Those are the planets that we refer to uh, today. The word planet comes from Planetis Asteris, wandering star. It's a Greek term. Now, the ancient Greeks actually considered the sun and the moon planets as well, because they too wandered. And they're very, very right. So you had... A total of seven objects. You have the Sun, the Moon, what we today call Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. That's a total of seven objects. And as it turns out, there are seven days in the week. Each day is named after one of these objects. So Sun, Sunday, Moon, Monday, uh, Tuesday is Mars, Wednesday is Mercury, uh, Thursday is Jupiter, Friday is Venus, and Saturday, Saturn, Saturn's Day. It doesn't sound too obvious when you say it in English. If you speak Spanish or any sort of romance language, you'll, you know, Jueves is, is Thursday. Sounds like Jupiter. Viernes, Venus, Friday. Martes is Tuesday. Sounds a lot like Mars, doesn't it? That is how that works. The seven days of the week, representing these seven different objects that you see traveling through the sky. The sun, the moon, and all the planets appear to travel on this nice flattened out line, this plane of the ecliptic, which also travels through 12 particular constellations, just like there's 12 
months in the year, there are 12 constellations that the sun travels through, the moon and all the other planets follow suit. We call them the Zodiac. There's actually a 13th Zodiac constellation. The moon is actually sitting in it tonight. It's Ophiuchus right up here. And we're not going to talk too much about him. At least he has clothes on in this particular planetarium. I've been in some planetariums where he doesn't. Talk about that. Again, if you have any questions, ask them in chat. I will try to answer things as we go along. You can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Or you can interact. This uh, That's the huge advantage of doing it this way over being in an actual planetarium. When you're in a planetarium, you can't see anybody raising their hand. So uh, here... Doing it this way, we're actually able to interact with people, and that's what makes this a lot more fun. So we're going to jump out of the planetarium software here for a second. We're going to head over to Universe Sandbox. So, why do the planets appear to travel on this flattened out plane? And the answer lies over here. Here we are looking at our solar system. The sun is the anchor right in the middle of our solar system. It is a ball of plasma, heated up gases, hydrogen turning into helium in its core, fusing into helium and letting out energy the glowing ball that gives us life, lets plants do photosynthesis, and lets us eat plants, and for those that are meat eaters, lets the plants be eaten by meat product. <laughs> Animals that then become meat products. As we zoom out, we will see, well, howdy, Eric Costa. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These are the first four planets of our solar system. We call them terrestrial planets. Terra means Earth-like. You can also call them rocky planets. Mercury and Venus, because they are closer to the sun, we only see them in the early morning or right after sunset. It all just depends on where they are in their orbit around the sun. Uh, Mercury, which again, you can see tonight, looks kind of like this. It's just a big, ro it's a small rocky ball, I should say. It's a small rock floating around the sun, super, super close. Uh, very inhospitable, no atmosphere, no satellite or moons orbiting around it. Uh, the side facing the sun is baking, the side facing away from the sun is not so pleased either. You're either baking or you're freezing. Uh, you have no choice between the two. Not too much going on. Mercury is actually one of the least investigated planets because it's so hard to get to. When we launch satellites away from the Earth, if you launch them the wrong way, they end up in the sun bad. If you launch it the wrong way, the other way, you miss Mercury completely and it's kind of hard to turn around and get to it. So, Not too many orbiters have been to Mercury. Only a few have actually been to this planet. This is the planet Venus. Uh, people call it the Earth's evil twin. It's about the size of our planet, a little bit smaller, a little bit less gravity, but it has this very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. Uh, it reflects a huge amount of sunlight, so that means it's very, very bright in the sky. That's why it is referred to as the goddess of love and beauty. It's very beautiful to see. Uh, you can see it again tonight in the western sky right after sunset. Venus is a very strange planet, though. It does rotate the wrong way, so the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. And because it takes so long for it to rotate on its axis, well, a day on Venus is almost as long as the year. Now think about that. A day on Earth is 24 hours and... That's what we call it, 24-hour day. That's going to take 210, 220 days or so for Venus to rotate around the same way. Very, very strange. Uh, this is, of course, the Earth. And if you look at the Earth at night, you can see the cities of our beautiful lens. We are in South America. You can see Sao Paulo. You can see Rio de Janeiro, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Mexico City. You can see Atlanta, D.C., New York, you name it, if I just push the play button. Hopefully it doesn't go too fast. We'll actually just watch the Earth rotating around. Always kind of fun. There's Japan, there's China, India, Eastern, the Middle East. Now, you were, if you want to see the sky the way it's truly meant to be seen, you don't want to be where all these bright splotches are. I like showing this off because it's two things. One, it means you can see our civilization from space at night. Two, you want to be away from the bright city lights. We call that light pollution. Uh, we'll look at an example of that in just a little bit. Did by Earth. 
Uh, last one we're going to talk about, you cannot see tonight, is the planet Mars. Mars is behind the sun from our point of view right now. And so we can't see it at night or in the daytime. Uh, this is the planet Mars, about half the size of the Earth. has a 24-hour, 37-minute long day and a very similar tilt uh, to the Earth, axial tilt. So it actually has seasons, just like our planet does. This is Valles Marineris and the Tharsis Montes. Valles Marineris is this huge crevice along its surface, about 8 kilometers deep. Then you have the Tharsis Montes, these three shield volcanoes right along here. And this, this is Valles... Uh, not Valles Marineris. This is Olympus Mons. This is Mount Olympus. Uh, if you look at this map of the United States, you see the American Southwest. You've got Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. Pick a state. This volcano is as big as all of them, or as one of them. So if you pick New Mexico, which is where I live, uh, you would take this and it would cover up the entire state. Same thing with Arizona. Same thing with Colorado. Same thing with Utah. This is a huge volcano, and you'll actually notice it actually sticks up from the surface just a little bit. The tip, tip, tip top of it sticks up above the very thin carbon dioxide atmosphere of the planet Mars. Past Mars, you find the asteroid belt. You see these very, very chaotic orbits of the asteroids. Asteroids are leftover chunks. Uh, they were not planets. They may have been a planet at some point and maybe broke apart. Some of them are round, as you can see here. Some of them are chunks of rock. Some of them are chunks of iron. Some of them are just oblong, like, potato-shaped rocks floating around in space. Uh, so you never know uh, what you're going to see when you look through the asteroid belt. I'm going to kind of take a quick peek at a couple of them. There we go. Once you pass the asteroid belt, you enter into the realm of the giants. We have the gas giant planets, or Jovian planets. Jove referring to Jupiter. Jupiter and Saturn are out tonight, and I will show you where to find them. Let's zoom in on Jupiter. I didn't show you with Mars. Mars does have two very small moons. They are actually captured asteroids. With Jupiter... Well, just like the stories of Jupiter or Zeus, you'll see there's a huge... All of these little dots that have just appeared, these are all objects that are in orbit around the planet. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system. It is a gas giant, as you see here. Trying to add some rings to it, but I'm not going to mess around with it because I think uh, the moons are going to be just enough. There are rings around Jupiter, but they're very, very thin. You don't see them unless you're behind the planet. You do see what's called the Great Red Spot, this huge hurricane-like storm right here. You could fit the Earth across it about three and a half times. It is huge! It's been going on for about 400 years. This was discovered in the year 1610 by Galileo Galilei, and it's still going. Now, around Jupiter, you have four very large moons that are easily seen through a telescope. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Ganymede is actually the biggest moon in the solar system. It's actually bigger than the planet Mercury. Io, which we see here, is a volcanic moon whose surface is constantly changing. It's a little too close to Jupiter. And so as it orbits around, it gets tugged on and pulled back and forth. Eventually, we'll get too close to the planet and be ripped apart. Europa is this beautiful moon right here. It is a icy moon who has a very, which has a thick crust on it. And scientists are pretty sure there's some sort of salty, briny ocean under its surface. We've not seen it directly, but there's lots of indications, magnetic indications and things of that nature that there's likely an ocean of water under its surface. This is Ganymede. Heavily battered, also an icy crust, maybe an ocean under its surface. Again, one of those things that we need to go back and investigate. It had an orbiter around these particular moons in a very long time. The Juno orbiter is orbiting around Jupiter right now, but I don't believe they're actually orbiting around any of the moons at the moment, just the planet. Uh, this is Callisto, the final of the four. You can see all four of these again through a telescope when you look at Jupiter. Uh, Callisto is the furthest out of those four moons. 
Let's zoom back out. We're going to jump over to Saturn, which is out tonight. And weirdly, when you first arrive in this software, they don't have rings. You need to fix that. There we go. Let's add some rings. Let's add some moons. Let's actually look at Saturn the way it should be. There we go. So Saturn does have rings, which we see from the Earth. Uh, here you see that they are actually all particles, which is true. When you look at the planet Saturn, you see its rings. Really, you're just looking at a bunch of very, very reflective particles uh, reflecting back sunlight towards the Earth. Now, Saturn's rings also hide a couple of its moons. Some of its moons are actually in the ring system itself. You can see them over here. Pandora and Pan are a couple of them. They are called shepherd moons. They actually shepherd the ring systems around. The most interesting, well, there's a couple of really interesting moons around Saturn. Trying to find it without having to search for it. There we go. This is Enceladus. Not Salad, Ensalada, but Enceladus. This is much like Europa. It has an icy crust. We're pretty sure there's a liquid water ocean under its surface. Because when we had an orbiter around Saturn, it recorded geysers of water shooting out from the surface. I think we should go back and see it. We should probably go back and check it out. Now, of Saturn's moons, Titan is the largest one. And Titan has an interesting feature. Titan has an atmosphere. Not an atmosphere you and I could breathe. Where are you, Titan? Oh, Titan. Oh, God, what happened? No! No! It's not what I wanted. <sighs> well, let's go back to Saturn anyway. Titan has an atmosphere of methane, natural gas, as you and I would call it here on the Earth. Uh, so that's probably not a fun smelling planet, maybe, although that smell is added in artificially uh, so people don't get sick or blow themselves up. Nonetheless, this is the Saturn system. There's Titan way out here. I always forget Titan's actually pretty far away from the planet. There we go. When you look at Titan, you see this very thick methane atmosphere, bright orange. Very strange. There's actually lakes of water, uh, lakes of not water, but natural gas in liquid form floating around. Actually rains natural gas as well. <clears throat> Let's zoom back out. Uh, Saturn, after Saturn comes Uranus. There we go. Now with Uranus, the interesting feature is the fact that it doesn't have any features. It's a very blank canvas, so to speak. But here's the interesting thing. All the other planets had North Pole pointing up and South Pole pointing down. That's not the case with Uranus. Uranus is on its side. In fact, it's a ring system. It does have a ring system. They're very, very thin, but they are there. You can see a very thin ring system now. And again, everything's right on its, on its side. The entire system. No one's sure why Uranus is on its side. The North Pole faces the sun for half of its year. Then the South Pole faces the sun for half of its year. It is a mystery of our solar system how that happened. Likely a huge gravitational shift. Maybe something came by, another star or a black hole. No one's really sure. This is the Neptune system. Neptune, of course, is named for the sea god. Why are you doing this? Go back to Neptune. There we go. Now, Neptune has a very interesting moon named Triton orbiting around it. Triton's way out here. Triton's a goofball. All the other planets we've talked about so far, the majority, if not all of their moons, orbit around the same direction that it rotates. So if the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the whole, you know, the whole system goes one direction. 
Triton appears to go the opposite direction, implying that it was captured, that it didn't form with Neptune and the rest of its moons, that it probably came from somewhere else and was captured. That somewhere else is out here in what's called the Kuiper Belt. This is where you find Pluto and Qualwar and Sedna and all these frozen ice balls. It's the realm of the comets out near the edge of the solar system. Now, we've gone all the way through the solar system. I still haven't really answered the question. Why does the sun, the moon, and all the planets appear to be on a flat plane in our nighttime sky? Looking at our solar system from the edge, you notice flattened out plane. Yes, we have these outliers, and that's why they're not considered planets. That includes Pluto. This is the main body of the solar system, and you see the sun, the moon, and the planets all appear to have the same belt line, the same waistline. They're not totally on that line completely, but for all intents and purposes, you can say the solar system is like a flattened out plane, so think of, uh, I don't know, like a pizza dish or something. You have the solar system, the sun right in the middle, all these planets are kind of spread out along the pizza. That is why you see the sun, the moon, and the planets traveling along this, the plane of the ecliptic. Looks like the planetarium kept moving even though I wanted it paused, so let's reset that. Sorry about that. We never really want to reset things when we're going along, but there we go. This again is the sky tonight, right around oh, 8, 15, 8, 30 or so. You have Venus in the southwest sky, and you'll have the moon fitting right smack dab right over here. Now, the moon is approaching first quarter. There we go. There's a first quarter moon. Which means the moon's gone one quarter of the way around our planet. We're going to look at the phases of the moon here in just a second. See the bright side on the right side? We call it a waxing moon. As you can see, the moon is sitting between three constellations. We've got Ophiuchus, this oddly shaped cone up here. You've got a J of stars. This one's super easy to find. This is Scorpius, or Scorpio. Bright red star right in the middle of it called Antares. That is the heart of the scorpion. The moon was actually right above Antares yesterday. It's moved to here tonight. And then tomorrow we'll be sitting in the top of this teapot. The teapot is Sagittarius. Arrow pulled back, aiming towards the heart of the scorpion and the heart of the Milky Way galaxy, which is in the background. If you don't know what a galaxy is, we're going to talk about them in just a little bit, but let's talk about the moon. Of course, again, if you have any questions, post it up in chat and we will talk about them as best we can. Let us go back to our web browser real fast. Maybe? Please? <laughs> okay. Sure, why well, my red brother's not showing up? Hmm. Okay, well then I guess we'll have to use a different method. This would have been more efficient, but that's okay. Back to Sandbox Universe. There is a moon thing in here that we'll just use that. As the moon orbits around the sun, or around the Earth, which orbits around the sun, the moon appears to reflect back a different amount of light towards us here on the Earth. There we go. Do you see the moon over here? The moon is our closest natural companion. The darker areas are the seas, or the quote-unquote mare of the moon. Mare, I should say, or the quote-unquote seas of the moon. Now, this is once thought to be oceans of water, and obviously they are not. Uh, they are oceans of what used to be lava that then filled in. The side facing the Earth always keeps the same side looking towards us. We call that tidally locked, and so... For a long time, people thought the back side of the moon was the dark side, but they didn't understand how the moon's dynamics work. As the moon orbits around the Earth, different parts of the moon reflect back sunlight. And we call those the phases. And when the bright side's on the right-hand side of the moon, we call it a waxing moon. When the bright, hand, when the bright side's on the left-hand side of the moon, we call it waning moon. 
eventually you get to the point where the moon is actually in the sun in the sky with the sun at the same time all the lights bouncing off the back side of the moon which is coming up right here people call it the dark side but it's not really the dark side when it's getting sunlight for a few evenings or a few days i should say this entire cycle we're actually looking at the back side of the moon now this is the side you don't see from the earth whatsoever this entire cycle takes 29 earth days or 29 and a half earth days we call it a month so our calendars are built on how many objects you see in the sky so the sun the moon and five planets so that's a total of seven so seven days of the week and then we've got a month built around the cycle of the moon and then we've got a year built on the 12 constellations that the sun travels through interesting isn't it so this is what's new moon phase from the earth you would see literally nothing because the moon's not reflecting any sunlight so unfortunately i can't get back to my uh web browser here I think I know what's going on. I'm going to turn off Stellarium real fast and then reset it. Bear with me, folks. We just got to roll with it. Rebooting Stellarium in the background. Not sure why that's there, because that's actually not there anymore. Hey, it worked. Perfect. All right. Back to my moon. Nope, that's not what I'm talking about. There we go. There's a good look at the moon orbiting around the Earth. With the Earth in rotation. You have the sun at the bottom of our screen here. You can see as the moon orbits around. Ignore the, the ship looking things. Those are the sun's rays, obviously. This is not to scale either, but you see as the moon orbits around, this is one quarter of the way around our planet. So that's a quarter moon, first quarter moon. As it continues to orbit around, it will reflect more and more sunlight. And of course, it doesn't follow the same path every time. Sometimes the moon falls into the Earth's shadow, and that we call a lunar eclipse. That means the moon is going into the Earth's shadow for a period of time. The Earth's shadow eclipses it. Uh, this is during a full moon, which is actually right now. That would be a full moon when the Earth is between the sun and the moon itself. And the moon keeps going, approaching what is called third quarter moon. Now you start to see the moon later and later in the evening, earlier and earlier in the morning. Getting dimmer and dimmer, quote unquote. Still the same exact face looking towards us. It's just in a different part of its orbit around our planet. Here we are seeing a third quarter moon. Three quarters of the way around our planet, the bright side now on the left hand side, most definitely, uh, re approaching what we call a new moon. And again, the new moon is actually when the moon is between us and the sun. During those times, that's when you can get what's called a solar eclipse. Solar eclipses is when the moon covers up the sun partially or maybe totally. All just depends on the moon's orbit around our planet and how well it lines up. Lunar eclipses are safe. Solar eclipses are not safe to view if you don't have filters. Uh, sunglasses do not count. You need really, really, really heavy filters. Uh, we're talking uh, kind of like those things you use when you do welding. Welder's uh, mask to be able to see this sort of event. And the cycle begins again. Glad I got the web browser to work. I'm not sure what uh, what the issue was there in the background. Let's get back to our planetarium software. The other planetarium software. The other planetarium software. Thank you. <laughs> and we're live on Twitch TV and YouTube and Facebook 
in a roundabout way on Facebook. Not sure why that server is not working for me, but it is what it is. So here we are again looking at the sky tonight. We talked about some of the constellations down here. Let's talk about some more planets, shall we? In the southeast sky tonight, you will see two very bright objects. They rise up a little bit after, actually at this time the sun is setting as well, you should see them in this general area. You will see the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter is the fourth brightest object in the sky. The sun is the brightest, then the moon, and then Venus, and then Jupiter. So if you see Venus super bright in the southwest sky, turn around and look towards the southeast sky, and you will see the planet Jupiter, which we did talk about a little bit ago. Uh, here again, if you zoom in, you see Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Sometimes one of the moons, or maybe more of them, are behind the planet. Sometimes they're in front. Sometimes they cast a shadow and you see a weird little circle on the planet itself. Uh, you won't see the red spot tonight, that's unfortunate, but you can see the bands of the planet very easily. Zooming in on Saturn, however, let's click over here and zoom in. There we go, Saturn is further away, so it's not as bright. It does have a golden yellow tinge to it. Even a small telescope will reveal the quote-unquote ears of Saturn. They are the rings, as we call them. As we zoom in, you see the Cassini division, the darker ring right in here. It's actually kind of an empty ring. And then the Enki gap is this little small ring right out here. Also empty, but there are actually little tiny moons. Again, the shepherd moons in the ring system. So that's where Saturn is tonight. You will see, again, Jupiter and Saturn in the southeast. You will see Venus and, hopefully, Mercury in the southwest. Both of those planets are sitting in the constellation Capricorn, uh, heading into Aquarius, the water bearer, right next door. Uh, take a quick peek. Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing today? Feel free to say hello in chat if you get a chance. Uh, let's take a look at some of these things up close. There's Jupiter up close. Uh, there's the red spot. This is, I believe, a Hubble photo, and I believe this is Europa over here on the left. And again, you can find lots of stuff on these different, what we call the Galilean moons. Uh, we looked them up close a little while ago, but uh, NASA has huge galleries available on their website. You just look up Jupiter or the outer planets, find them. Saturn, I just absolutely love this planet. It is just so pretty to look at. And uh, this is one of many, many photos I found uh, on the Cassini-Huygens space probe mission. There's a good look at Titan. We talked about Titan just a couple minutes ago. Uh, this is actually looking through the atmosphere. This is actually the many lakes of methane actual mountain ranges like it's a cool little moon we should probably go check it out there's Enceladus uh, which I also talked about when we were doing our 3d fly through this of the solar system uh, there again you see the cracks along its surface and I believe yep there we go this is actually looking at the geysers of water spitting out from the surface itself we really should go and investigate these things but we have to be very careful we don't want to contaminate these little worlds these are prime candidates for if there's life out there in our solar system, it's going to be around one of these. It's going to be around Jupiter, Saturn. It's going to be on one of those. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? Want to talk about deep sky stuff or should we talk about more constellations? Well, let's talk about constellations. We haven't totally ignored the northern part of the sky so far. Let's actually turn around and look north. And we know we're looking north because we're cheating and it says N at the bottom here. <clears throat> That's funny. It's not Okay, it's not funny. We also know we're facing north because the sun's set in the west, which means north is to your right. If the sun is already gone and you're just out in the middle of nowhere, there's two things you can look for to find that you're actually looking north. One, you're going to be looking for a three or a W or a triangle of stars in the sky. This right up here is the constellation called Cassiopeia. Beautiful queen who angered the gods and the goddesses, especially the nymphs as well. 
And uh, she was so vain, she said she was more beautiful than all of them. They strapped her to her throne and threw her up into the sky. See her looking at a mirror up here. The other one is actually part of a constellation. A lot of people know the Big Dipper. Four stars of a tail, three stars making a cup. Those total of seven stars make up the Big Dipper, but they are not a constellation. They are what's called an asterism. They are only a portion of a much bigger grouping of stars, the constellation Ursa Major, the Big Bear. If you can find either of these groupings of stars, the three or W shape of Cassiopeia, or the seven stars of the Big Dipper, you will be able to find True North. You'll find the North Star using either one. Let's actually be able to draw some lines here. So we're going to draw, there's the tail of the Dipper. One, two, three. There's the tail. One, two, three, four. So there's the cup. These last two stars we call the Pointer Stars. Because they point, if you draw a line right through them, they point to Polaris. Polaris is the pole star, the north star, the load star. It is not the brightest star in the nighttime sky. That is uh, the star Sirius, is the bright time night, brightest nighttime star. But Polaris happens to sit in a very particular place. It does not set from our point of view. As long as you're above the equator, if you're anywhere north of the equator, you will see the north star pretty much in the sky at all times. The height of the North Star depends on where you are. Where I live, it is 35 degrees above the horizon. If you live further north, the North Star will be higher up in the sky. If you live further south, the North Star will be lower in the sky. You can also find the North Star using Cassiopeia, which we talked about just a second ago. There's three stars making a triangle right here. And three more stars making another triangle right here. So we're looking for easy to find shapes. Triangles are easy to find shapes. Draw a line between these two, then draw a line right through them, making an arrowhead. And you find, once again, the North Star, the Pole Star, the Lode Star, Polaris. As you've seen, just leave this line on it. Everything seems to rotate. These are called circumpolar stars. They circle the pole. The North Star appears to stay in the same exact place throughout the entire evening. So it's a good thing to navigate by. Now, I do apologize. This will be an abrupt change of time here. So we're going to reset. Went through a whole evening there. We're going to reset and go back to nighttime. Let's get rid of that. So, we've talked about a lot of things you can see in the sky tonight without using a telescope. Now I want to show you something really cool, but you do need a telescope to find them. We just talked about finding the North Star, but we're still going to be using this Big Dipper shape. Again, the Big Dipper is not a constellation. The, the whole constellation is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. If you follow the tail of the Dipper, these three stars, you can follow the arc of the tail. Up this way, go this way. You arc to a reddish colored star named Arcturus. Right over here. It's the brightest star in Boetes. Boetes. This guy right there. Just below the tail of the Dipper. Imagine you're standing outside, you hold your hand up, and you've got your hand as far out as you can reach. Put three fingers below this last star. Last star has a name. It is Alcade. Don't worry about it. If you put three fingers below Alcade, you'll end up somewhere in this general vicinity. If you can just draw a line straight down towards the horizon and you have a telescope, you're going to see something really, really cool. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. <laughs> Just sitting there. This is a whole nother galaxy with millions of stars, billions of planets, billions of moons. It won't look like this through a telescope for you. It'll look like a little fuzzball. This is a Hubble photo. I'll actually look at this in just a little bit. Zoom back out. So this is right below the tail of the Dipper. If you draw a line between these two stars of the Dipper's tail, these two here, stop in the middle and go up. About the same distance. Guess what? Oh god, I closed it. Womp womp. Just above, there is actually another galaxy, and we're going to look at that here in a second. 
I have made a boo-boo and control queued, which uh, closed out my program. Whoops. I'm a professional, I swear. <laughs> Nothing but technical difficulties, but we're just going to roll with it. All right, back to our dipper tail. There it is. Between these two stars, stop and go right up. This is the pinwheel galaxy. There you are. Again, these are spiral galaxies. Our Milky Way looks something like this. There's one last thing I want to show you, and this is actually something I'm going to cover in our monthly update next month. Draw a line straight up from the dipper's tail. In this direction, you'll connect three stars. Just past this middle star. That's where you want to be. Stop here. Just above it. You're going to find something really cool. This is what's called the Draco Trio. These are three different kinds of... Sp oh, there's two spirals. There's a spiral right here. You're looking right along it. So you can see it as a spiral. This one is a spiral galaxy along the edge. So it looks like a little pancake. And then this is an elliptical galaxy right in the middle. Those three are in the constellation Draco the Dragon, which is currently seen there. There's a stick figure. Very, very cool. Lots of, again, deep sky objects. These are things that are not part of our Milky Way that we're talking about so far. There are some deep sky objects that are part of the Milky Way. And a good example of that, let's rotate around. Remember, we just follow the arc of the tail. We arc to Arcturus. If we draw a line straight up... Oh my god, I did it again. I need to change the key binds because Control A and Control Q are a little too close to each other. And I keep killing the program. That's bad. We follow the arc of the tail. We arc to Arcturus. If you draw a line straight up from Arcturus, you'll find a bright star named Vega. Now, Vega is part of a triangle of stars that you only see during the summer months. You have Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Vega right here. Deneb, the tail of the swan. And then Altair, right over here. This is the Summer Triangle. We're no longer in summer. We're approaching winter. Actually, next week we'll hit the Equinox, and then we'll be out of summer, heading towards through the fall towards the winter. So these are going to be getting lower and lower towards the sky. Uh, towards the horizon, I should say. In any case, if you draw a line between Arcturus and Vega, Vega will be almost directly above your head, and a very, very bright blue. You'll notice you do track a lot of sky. We're talking twice the width of your hand easily. But you'll go through this weird little square of stars right in here, little rhombus. If you stop right there, if you can imagine drawing a straight line between these two and stop right in the middle, you will see one of these deep sky objects that is part of our Milky Way. And this is actually what's called the Great Cluster in Hercules. This is a globular cluster. Globular clusters have thousands, sometimes millions of stars, all grouped together in a big blob. They orbit above or below the Milky Way. I want you to notice where this object is. We're going to leave the marker on it. Here's the heart of our galaxy. Our galaxy makes this huge streak. Again, go back to our pizza analogy. Imagine the galaxy is a pizza. This is something you're holding above the pizza or maybe something under the table below the pizza. So there's some that are up here. There's some that are down here, so either above or below the Milky Way. There's a huge amount of what we call deep sky objects. You usually need a telescope to see them very easily. Uh, some of them you do need to do photos of. You can't just like look through a telescope and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. No big deal. Some of these are star clusters, such as the Beehive Cluster, or what we just looked at, which was, there's the Beehive Cluster. This is the Summer Beehive Cluster. Uh, some of them are globular clusters, like we just saw. This one's called the Sagittarius Cluster. So you notice these stars tend to be a lot brighter in the red spectrum. So stars have different colors depending on their temperature. Red stars tend to be colder. 
are, are considered colder than the sun. Yellow stars are of the same temperature, give or take, as the sun. Blue stars are hotter than the sun, and then bluish-white stars are even hotter than that. Good examples of those, again, are the stars Vega, Deneb, and Altair, which you can see tonight. They are bright blue, and they'll be directly above your head tonight. They straddle the Milky Way. Vega appears to be above it. Deneb is actually in it, and then Altair below it. All three of them are actually in the Milky Way, because we're all in the Milky Way. Get rid of that. If you can find Vega, just right over here. If you zoomed in on that part of the sky, you will actually find something really, really pretty. This is something called the Ring Nebula. When stars get older, they change color, they cool off, they eventually quote-unquote die in different ways. Sometimes they explode violently and sometimes they die quietly. A star like our sun will die quietly and leave behind a big cloud, kind of like this. This is a planetary nebula. There we go. Zoom back out. Hmm. What's going on back? In the browser, so that's good. Or why? I think I answered that question. But... Yep. Sorry, I'm looking at chat. Okay. Let's actually take a look up close at some of the objects we just talked about. Do that we got to go over here there we go so this is actually the whirlpool galaxy but from the hubble space telescopes we just get to look at it very very clearly you see what are called star forming regions the bright reddish colored areas hydrogen alpha regions right in here all along the edges you notice older redder colored stars are going to be towards the central part of the galaxy there actually is a companion galaxy for a long time people didn't know if it was actually related to it or not. Turns out this material right here is being siphoned off and pulled backwards towards this other galaxy. Lots of dust and gas, the darker areas you see. The core or heart of the galaxy right smack dab there. What else did we talk about? We talked about the pinwheel galaxy. That was this one. So it's a much better view of it. Same basic structure. You don't see as many star-forming regions in this one. It may just not have been tuned uh, to look for those. They're going to be in these cloudy regions, so this is likely a star-forming region here and here and here and here. They probably have to just go through and recolor this a little bit to get that reddish color. And then finally, this was that Draco trio that we talked about. three separate galaxies. Looks like this is actually upside down from the other one. So this is the spiral that was up top. This is the elliptical, or I guess some people even call it lenticular in the middle. And then you have the uh, spiral from the edge. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at the Milky Way as we start to wind down our show. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, looks something like this. Stars, gas, and it obviously this is sped up very, very much. Do you really want to think about things 
Uh, in context, let's imagine that you see our, see my mouse right here. Let's imagine that our sun is out here somewhere. During the age of the dinosaurs, our sun was actually way over here. The entire galaxy is constantly spinning like a whirlpool or a spinning top. Smack dab in the middle, you're going to find the core of the galaxy, the black hole at the middle of our galaxy, supermassive black hole. Looking at it from the edge, which is what we're doing here, you can see this is what it looks like at night, but from our point of view, it seems to go vertically in our sky, so we're all kind of on our side. Things are kind of wonky in space. Who knows which direction is actually up? The globular clusters you see kind of coming up and down, going through the galaxy itself as everything spins around. Our galaxy is part of what's called the local group of galaxies. Local group of galaxies has the Milky Way and multiple other galaxies. Uh, this is one of the other galaxies. Why it starts off here, I don't know. The Milky Way looks slightly less nice, but you see all these other little dots. These are now galaxies. Got the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, the Magellanic Clouds, which we talked about earlier. There's the Large Magellanic Cloud. And the Small Magellanic Cloud is up that way. And back to the Milky Way. Now, there is another large galaxy group nearby. These are all part of the local group. But this grouping of galaxies is known as the Andromeda Galaxy, and actually it's got a companion right nearby. We'll look at that in just a little bit. Andromeda is also a spiral galaxy. It is actually bigger than the Milky Way, and in space, when you are bigger, you have more gravity. More than likely. So, it's on a collision course. The Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way have a date. In a few million years, the Andromeda Galaxy seen here up top, uh, and the Milky Way seen here at the bottom, uh, they will be doing a very, very interesting dance to the point where they will merge together over a very long period of time. As you see here, some stars will be thrown out into space. Some stars may collide. There's a lot of empty space between stars, but, you know, there's a low possibility of it happening. These two spiral galaxies will now merge into some sort of lenticular or ring galaxy. Two black holes in the middle trying to find some sort of equilibrium as they try not to destroy each other. Now, you can see Andromeda tonight, but to do that, we need to get out of this and go back to our other screen. So let's get out of this. Go to our planet Arium. To find Andromeda, you got to look towards the north. So here we are facing south, east, north, northeast is where we're looking. Remember we talked about... Siopea. Three or the W in the sky. That's good. Nearby, you will see a big square. This great square is the body of Pegasus, the flying horse of legend. Because when you think horse, you think big square in the sky, I'm sure. I didn't think so either. I didn't make I don't make the rules. Sorry, talking with chat. Um, didn't make the rules. It's just that's what it looks like. It's a big square. Hanging off the square, you will find there is a beautiful maiden, a chained maiden that is Andromeda herself. 
And she looks kind of like a big A coming off of it. Missing that part of it. Find the great square of Pegasus. This star here. One, two, three. And count up. One, two, three. Just above it is the Andromeda Galaxy. You can you can actually pretty well see it if you get out of town. Uh, you can also find it using Cassiopeia, which again is up here. Use that same arrowhead, draw a line through the middle, and use the tip instead. And it'll point you to the same direction. This is the Andromeda Galaxy. This is our nearest large spiral companion. Here you can see its companion galaxy as well. We have a date in a few million years. This object is 2.25 million light years away. That's the speed of light traveling for 2.25 million years. That's a huge distance. And that'll be the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that, well, when you look up at night, you're actually looking back through time as well. The light you see takes a finite, you know, it's got a speed. It has a, a speed limit in space. And so some of the objects we talked about may not exactly be or may not exactly look like that anymore may not be in the same place anymore, and they may not look like that anymore. The cool thing is to think about things spatially. Yeah, get it? Spatially? Hey. But in reality, I, I want you to think about this. Stars form in star-forming regions, huge clouds of spa in space. They form stars, they form planets, they form moons. Those stars live for a certain amount of time, and then they grow old, they puff up, they become red giant stars, and they die. And that's actually something we haven't even really talked about, is red giant stars. Let's actually go to the other screen. When you look up at night, you're looking back in time. All the stars are different distances away. You just want a blank canvas. And they're all different sizes. So sometimes when you see a really bright star in the sky... It's just a really bright star that happens to be very close by, like our sun. Like this. Oh, nope, that's not what I wanted. I want a empty simulation. There we go. I just want the sun. There we go. So there's the sun. We're going to compare the sun to some other stars, shall we? Uh, I mentioned the star Sirius earlier. That's also the name of my puppy. Oh, God. The simulation was moving. Oh, what did I do? I broke it. Let's try that again. <laughs> that was a joke. Let's take a look at our sun compared to Sirius. And you're going to see really fast. The sun is not all that bright comparatively. You can see Sirius is much brighter and it's also a little bit bigger it's also a bluer star blue stars live shorter lives they live by the live fast die young there's spica which we talked about a little bit that's the star in virgo here's rigel look at how much bigger rigel is rigel's a blue giant star it's huge uh we mentioned antares earlier didn't we Let's see if i can find antares in the list We did talk about Arcturus. There, it's that star there. We're just going to be listing some stars that we talked about. Terry's. Look at that. Look at how big the sun is. Way down here. And look at that. Stars get huge. This star is a, a red giant star. It's a star nearing the end of its lifetime. There's Betelgeuse. You can see it's also a huge star. Neither of these stars can compare to... An even bigger star, this one right here. Look at that. That kind of runs the gamut between stars. A star like our sun, very small. And actually, believe it or not, there's even smaller stars. If you're a Star Trek fan, you know of Wolf 359, which was a great battle against the Borg. Well, Wolf 359 is a tiny little star. Look at that. Tiny, insignificant little star compared to our sun, which is right up here. Look at how much bigger stars can get. They're trying to fuse different elements, hydrogen to helium, helium to lithium, and carbon, and oxygen. And they keep going through the periodic table till they get to iron. Iron is kind of the death throw of a star. 
it takes more energy to fuse iron into heavier elements than it does than, than you get back. If you fuse hydrogen into helium, it releases a little bit of energy. That's what makes a star glow. Once you pass iron, though, the star starts to run out of energy. It starts cooling off. That's why it goes from maybe a blue star to one of these red giant stars. It puffs up, trying to keep equilibrium, trying to keep temperatures and pressures all the same. And it doesn't really work. The star gets huge. It puffs up. And eventually, it explodes. And if I push play, you'll see an explosion. There's multiple kinds of explosions. But when stars die... They will explode violently, or they'll die quietly. We looked at a quiet star death. That was that planetary nebula that we talked about earlier. Supernova is going to be something more like this when a star explodes violently and leaves behind a huge trail of dust and radiation. Something like this. But from these explosions you get heavier elements on the periodic table. Things like uranium that we use for nuclear power. Thorium, which we also should be using for nuclear power, but we don't because we're dum-dums. But it all goes back to iron. When you breathe in... In fact, breathe in five times right now. Nice deep breath. When you breathe in... You breathe in the atmosphere just nitrogen and oxygen, and that oxygen binds in your blood with hemoglobin, oxygenates your blood, and it goes around your, your body. Your blood turns red. In essence, there's iron in your blood that oxidizes or quickly rusts, quote-unquote. Where did the iron come from? You are made of stardust, hence why I call you all stardusters, why we have that little counter up there, why we need more people following so that counter can go up. You are all made of stardust, friends. When you look up at the sky at night, you see the stars the way they are, however far away they are. I'm going to pick a star, a random star. I'm just going to click on one. I don't care how far away it is, because we're not really going to pay attention to that. This one is 171 light years away. That's fine. It doesn't matter. We're going to ignore that number. I want you to imagine that this star is, I don't know, let's say 30 light years. 30 is a good number. And let's say tomorrow is my friend's birthday and my friend turns 30 years old. Set up a telescope and I make my friend look at this particular star 30 light years away on their 30th birthday. Tell me, what do they see? Well, they see a little point of light in the telescope, right? They see the star. But if this, this particular star is not, but if this star were 30 light years away and they turned 30 years old, they would be seeing the light that left that star the day they were born. And you can do this with any star. You look around, you can look through star catalogs. Try to find a star that's as far away as you are old. So this one says it's 89 light years away. So if you have, you know, Grandpa died a few years ago, but if Grandpa's 89 years old, if you show Grandpa this star on their 89th birthday, they see that star the way it looked the day that Grandpa was born. And that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. So now that you have all these beautiful things in the sky, the planets, the moons, the nebulae, the galaxies, all the stuff we've talked about, you also have this weird time component that you probably have never really thought about unless you've studied astronomy or know about general relativity. Time is relative to your speed in space. If you're going at the speed of light, time starts to slow down. From your point of view, time still moves forward, but time begins to what's called dilate. So time goes slower for you. That's the old paradox. If you do the mathematics of what's the, called the twin paradox. You send a twin off to, let's say, the star Vega, which is right up here. Let's say you put them on a rocket ship and send them off to Vega at the speed of light. They get to Vega, they turn around, come back. 
Vegas, <clears throat> excuse me, Vegas 25 light years away. But the speed of light, they traveled all the way to Vega, took 25 light years to get there, and then they came back, 25 light years. So, hypothetically, here on the Earth, 50 years have passed. But for the person that was in the rocket ship, time changed. Time went slower. They're actually not 50 years older. So if a brother and sister or a brother and brother or sister and sister, you split them apart, the one that stayed here on the Earth would be aged more than the one that was in the ship. The same amount of time has passed, but they were traveling at the speed of light. Or near the speed of light, and so time passed slower for them. That's an interesting thing to think about. Maybe it doesn't make sense. That's okay. Keep those questions. Ask them in chat. Ask them in the comment section down below. For this posts up to YouTube, because it will. Feel free to ask questions on any medium that we have. You can reach us on Twitter. You can reach us on Facebook. You can reach us over on YouTube as well as here on Twitch.tv. My name is Mike. As always, it's a pleasure to host astronomy shows for you. I hope you enjoyed some. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And I hope I'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves and each other. We'll see you.